Richard Wallace Rood. That's my name. Technically, anyway, but most people just call me Whitey. I'm a relatively healthy, 50-something, regular Joe in Los Angeles, California, the city of angels. It's been home for me for most of my adult life, and where I still earn a decent living as a private investigator. That's right, a private dick. Bringing a mean dose of reality to someone, especially a friend, always sucks. I would stop by the bar at the Alexandria Hotel for a short one before I walked the six blocks to Lou and Jay's Deli. Delivering bad news is always easier than sauced. Two minutes later, we arrived at the boys' spacious and stylish digs. The doors opened, and we spilled out of the little lift and into the foyer like Mo, Larry, and Curly Joe. Being an Asian household, we immediately removed our shoes and traded them for slippers. I walked over to the bar and filled a couple of heavy crystal tumblers with two fingers of Macallan's, the house scotch of choice. I made sure to add ice in Lou's glass, just the way he liked it. Me? I prefer my booze neat. Why dilute the experience, right? Carefully making my way back to the sofa, I set Lou's glass on the coffee table and strolled over to the window to take in the view from the top. Somehow the city didn't appear as dirty as it did from the street. I guess that was the advantage of living closer to the heavens. Taking a sip of my scotch, I turned back to survey the room, my eyes settling on the bank of photos neatly displayed on the closed baby grand piano. They formed a spiral around a tiny little vase filled with lilies like a circle of dominoes waiting to be knocked over. I walked over to the instrument and looked at all the pictures. There were several of a little girl. She appeared to be around 10 years old, and there was a couple that were younger. She was beautiful. She was selling November. I recognized her right away. You just can't hide from a smile like that. It commands your attention. I picked up May Lee's photo and stared at it a second before speaking. She was beautiful, Lou, really. She was. I heard the two of them settle into the sofa behind me. I looked at them both. They were sitting side by side, holding hands. I found your niece today, Lou. She's dead. I'm sorry. Lou lowered his head and stared at the floor. Jay rubbed his shoulders and said nothing, but I could hear him start to whimper. I waited for the shock to fade and watched Lou fight the urge to weep. His shoulders heaved a couple of times and at least one tear dropped onto the coffee table in front of him. There just wasn't anything else to say. You can tell when a conversation is over. You can feel it in your bones. I walked over to my grieving friends and placed a hand softly onto each of their shoulders, then turned to let myself out. I paused by the bar and contemplated seriously about pouring myself one for the road, then thought better of it. So I walked to the elevator without looking back and pressed the button on the wall. I had about three hours to kill before I went back to Sally's apartment and looked up her neighbor. I was anxious to start peeling this onion. Lou had a right to know the truth and I felt an obligation to get it for him. Me? I'm just a curious cat with a predilection towards using up my nine lives, which is exactly what would happen if Lieutenant Oscar Cilia caught me snooping around his crime scene. Some people go to the beach, or the park, or the library, or go home and sit in the dark in the favorite easy chair to do their thinking and figuring. Me? I go to the pub. The noisier the better. Nothing clears their head like a couple of pints of Guinness with a Jameson chaser. At least, that's how Whitey Rude does his important brainstorming. As was my practice, I jotted down what I knew, what I thought I knew, and what I wanted to know. I wrote one sentence on each page as I worked through my detective routine. It's a slow process, but it's tried and true and has served me well since grammar school. So in a nutshell, what do I know? One, Sally November was stone dead, or as the Scots say, tits up. Two, Sally November wasn't even Sally November. She was Maylee Tang. Three, Sally November kept bad company. Or at least, last night she did. Four. Sally November died without a struggle. There were no defensive wounds. And five, and probably most important, it'll be my ass if Lieutenant Celia catches me snooping around this case. The doors opened as he arrived home, and Lou exited in a huff. He passed through the foyer, then quickly crossed the living room to the sofa. 
He called out to Jay and heard himself over the speakerphone on Jay's open cell resting on the end table. Jay! He scanned the dark room, which was dimly lit by the glare from the city light streaming through the large bay window. He couldn't see well and squinted as his eyes adjusted to the dark. He didn't hear anything, except for his own movements. You know what? I don't got time for this. I'm gonna go back to work. You know where to find me. Lou walked back to the elevator without looking for his partner any further. What was the point? Jay was just setting him up for yet another bickering session. Lou hated those tiffs. The elevator doors had started to close when the shot rang out. BAM! Lou stuck out his hand to keep the doors from closing. He entered the hall and made his way to his bedroom. He could smell the cordite as it wafted toward him. The odor was caustic and made his nostrils flare. His skin became cold and he could feel the goosebumps forming on his bare arms. At the end of the long hallway, Lou entered the room that he and Jay had shared for so many years. He stopped at the foot of the bed and stared down at the lifeless form of his life partner. Jay lay motionless. The pillow he was laying on still smoking from the muzzle blast and a small trail of blood seeped from where the gunshot had scorched his hairpiece, a little secret he had guarded closely in life. The weapon, still in his hand, lay partially tucked beneath him at the small of his back. Lou traced his index finger over the length of Jay's form, beginning at his forehead and ending at his wrist. His legs were crossed the way they were when he worked the crossword on Sunday mornings. He didn't look as dead as he was. Well, except for the blood, maybe. Lou touched the gun in his hand. It was still warm. He pulled the weapon from Jay's hand. He held it, raised it high above him, admiring the dullness of it. It was black and square-like, with hard angles, and it was lighter than he had imagined. It almost didn't seem lethal at all. Almost like a toy. That was how I found him hours later, when Marco called me from the restaurant. He was afraid to call the cops, and I could understand why. Romeo and Romeo were dead. And for what? My job just became more than I bargained for. <laughs>